Let's look this morning at the third chapter of 2 Corinthians, verse 18. As here, Paul the Apostle tells us, but we all, with an open or an unveiled face, beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord, are changed into the same image from glory to glory, as by the Spirit of the Lord. Paul had been talking about how that the Jewish nation had a veil over their face when they were reading Moses, even as Moses had put a veil over his face when he had come down from bringing them the law. They did not seem to understand the law as God intended it, a veil over their face. But in contrast, we, with an unveiled face as we behold the glory of the Lord, are being changed into that image from glory to glory, even by the Spirit of the Lord. You see, when God first created man, God created man in his own image. Genesis 1, 26 and 27, And God said, Let us make man after our image and our likeness. And so God created man after his image and his likeness. The Bible tells us concerning God that God is light. Man was created in the image of God, and so man was created with that light or understanding of God. Adam instinctively knew God when he was first created because he was created in the light of God. The Bible tells us that God is love. So when God created man in his image, he created man with the capacity to love and he created man with the need for love. The Bible tells us that God is a spirit. So when God created man, he created man a spirit being. You see, the real me is spirit, not this body. This body is only an instrument in which I express myself. It is a tent in which I am presently dwelling, but I will soon be moving out of it into a beautiful new ma mansion not built with hands that is eternal in the heavens. The body isn't the real me. The real me is spirit. God is a spirit. I was created in the image of God and thus man was created as a spiritual being. That as he walked in the spirit, he might be one with God. Finally, the Bible teaches us that God is a self-determinant creature. That he wills his own will in the world. He created me in his image, and so he created me with the capacity of self-determination. I choose my own destiny. I become what I want to be. I choose with whom I will live. I choose where I will live, how I will live. I am a self-determinate being created in the image of God who is also a self-determinate being. So man was thus created in the image of God. Why would man 
be created in the image of God. God created man in the image of God so that man might know God. That's why he gave to man the enlightenment of himself. God created man a spiritual being that man might become one with God in the spirit. God created man with the capacity of love that he might receive the love of God and give love unto God. But in order that man's expressions of love to God be truly meaningful, God did create man a self-determinate being so that man could choose to love God or choose not to love God. Thus, the love is meaningful because it is a choice, not something that is forced. If I say to someone, you've got to love me, and I hold a 45 to their head and say, you've got to love me, you know. They may say, I love you, I love you. But it doesn't mean that they really do. It could mean they just don't want to slug through their brain. So if God forced us to love him, if there were no choice, if I had no alternative, then my expressions of love to God would be totally meaningless. God doesn't want that kind of a relationship. He wants a meaningful relationship. And so he created me in his image, giving me the capacity of choice, self-determination. But though man was created in the image of God, man soon fell from the image of God. Now the humanist today would have you to believe that God was a creation of man rather than man the creation of God. They say man needed to believe in something, so he created the concepts of God that he might believe in a higher power. But now we have evolved beyond that state of uh, primitive man and superstition, and we have recognized that God is only the creation of man. In so doing, They have left man in total darkness concerning God. Man was created in the image of God, but he soon fell from that image of God. For he exercised his choice in a very foolish way. He chose to disobey the command of God. God said, of all of the trees that are in the garden, you may freely eat except the tree that is in the midst of the garden. And in the day that you eat of it, you will surely die. God warned man that it was possible for his spirit to die, for him to lose that communion and fellowship with God, for him to lose that light and understanding of God. But man exercising this capacity of choice foolishly disobeyed God and as a result died spiritually. And having a spiritual death he became alienated from God. He began to walk in darkness. He no longer understood the truth of God. His foolish heart was now darkened. And rather than love being the chief motivating factor within, greed became the chief motivator of man. Now as I look at man today and as I look at the world today, I see that there are two powerful motivating forces. One is love, one is greed. 
And because these are the two powerful motivating forces, they actually spell the doom of communism. You see, capitalism thrives on greed. The capitalistic society exists because of greed. You work a little harder. You put in a little extra effort. You go the extra mile because if you do, you'll be able to gain more for yourself. You can get ahead. You can get those things that you desire. But communism has removed greed as a motivating force. No matter how hard you work, no matter how efficient you are, you all get the same level. Well then, why should I put out any more? And that is why the communistic nations cannot produce enough to take care of their own people. Whereas here, we're able to produce not only enough to take care of everyone in the United States, but we can take care of half the world because we have a stronger motivation. Communism has no motivation. Now, as you can obviously see, I'm not making a brief for capitalism nor for communism. They're both corrupt. I am waiting for a glorious kingdom that the Bible promises me is coming. It's a kingdom where man will be motivated only by love. Oh yes, we will equally share the resources of the world. But love will be the motivating force behind it. And it's because of our love for God and our love for each other that we'll go the extra mile, that we'll put in the extra effort, that we'll do a little bit more in order that you might be benefited and blessed. God's glorious kingdom. But man fell from the image of God and it is interesting as we read Paul's description in Ephesians chapter 4 beginning with verse 18. He said, having the understanding darkened. You see, he was created in the, in the image of God in light, but now his understanding has been darkened because of the fall. Being alienated from the life of God, his spirit died, and thus he was separated from God who is a spirit and the spiritual life of God. So alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them to work all... Uh, or <laughs> I jump. That is in them because of the blindness of their heart who being past feeling lost the emotions of love, had given themselves over to lasciviousness to work all uncleanness with greediness. Greed becoming the dominant motivating force within man. And so we see man fallen from this image of God. The humanist saying that you are a highly evolved form of animal existence denying God, would say that man is the crowning effort of the evolutionary processes to the present point. However, man may be replaced in the near future by a biocomputer. But the Bible says that no, you are not a highly evolved animal. You aren't at the peak, you have fallen from the peak and rather than a highly evolved animal, you are a fallen form of God. And that the missing link does not lie between you and an orangutan, but the missing link is somewhere between you and God. Now man in trying to find his roots degrades himself and goes downward. Whereas God seeks to draw men upward. And so the effect and the result of Christianity is always drawing men up where religious systems and all will push men down.
Now, though man has fallen from the image of God, it is God's desire to restore man into his image. And to this end, he sent his only begotten son. There are some men who have caught sight of the ideal. Somehow within them, they say, there's got to be a better way. Surely life has to be more than this. And the moment you say, there's got to be a better way, life has to be more than this, you are recognizing that there must be an ideal somewhere, though you may not be able to uh, define it. You're aware that it must exist, and there is that yearning for a better life, for a better way, for the ideal. And so the philosophers recognizing that there's got to be a better way sought to discover what was good. But unfortunately, they could not agree on the ideal. They could not agree as to what the image of God really was. Some philosophers said, well, it's this. And others said, oh, no, it's not that. It's this. Pleasure, that's the chief good. Oh, no, 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 not pleasure. Power, that's the real good of life. And, and so they went on with their various uh, concepts of what did constitute good until we finally came down the road into existential philosophy which said, oh, there isn't any real universal good It's if it's good to you. As you experience it, good is only as you experience it yourself and find it good. And so philosophy could not help man to the ideal because it uh, was too busy trying to discover what the ideal was. So the moralist came along. And the moralist said, yes, there is a good and a better way and we should all strive to discover and to walk in the better way. And so we had great moralists like Buddha, who said, don't do to others what you don't want them to do to you. And he pointed to the path and he said, that's the way you should walk. That's how you should live. The evil all lies in the material realm. And so you've got to divorce yourself from materialism, from material desires, and start living only in the realm of the spirit. Because all of the problems of man, the griefs and the sorrows, result from man's desire for the material things. Sounds pretty much like the gospel. Only it's the opposite of the gospel. Because if you just point the right way to me, and you just say, that's the way you should walk, but you don't help me to walk that way. I may, and I have tried to do the right thing. I've tried to be good, but somehow I don't find the capacity within me to do it. So to be able to see the good and not be able to walk in it is only frustrating. And it fills me with futility, and thus moralism ends ultimately in total frustration. And so with all of the moralists, Confucius or whatever, they are pointing to the path, but they give no dynamic by which to live the life. And so man is still here, alienated from God, walking in darkness, not having a full understanding of the things of God, only the yearning for something that he doesn't quite know what, but he knows must be somewhere, for life's got to be more than this. The humanist, of course, saw the futility and the despair of the philosophers 
and they saw the frustration that the moralist brought. And so the humanist said, hey, 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 you've all got it wrong. Your desire to try and be good is even wrong. Just live as you please. And don't let the moralist bother your conscience. But whatever is right to you, whatever is good for you, go for it. Just live completely after your own flesh because this is all she wrote anyhow. Now, enter the scene, Jesus Christ. God's desire to restore man to his image caused him to send his only begotten son. And here in verse 18 of chapter 3, Paul tells us the processes whereby we are restored into the image of God. We all with unveiled faces beholding the glory of the Lord. My being restored in the image of God begins with my looking at Jesus Christ and there seeing the glory of the Lord. Verse 6 of chapter 4. For God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness hath shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. I was created in the image of God in the beginning, enlightened in the way of God, but through sin, darkness filled man's heart. But even as the creation of light was the beginning of God's recreative acts in the book of Genesis, and God said, let there be light, so that is the first step of God's recreation process as he restores you into the image of his Son. Again, the glorious light of God shining in your heart through Jesus Christ. And so we, with open face, beholding the glory of the Lord, as we see that in the face of Jesus Christ, are being enlightened by God and being given an understanding once more of what God is really like. Jesus said to Philip, If you have seen me, you have seen the Father. And so I understand what the image of God is when I look at Jesus Christ. You see, unfortunately, if I want to know what God intended when he created man, I cannot look around me today because all of us have come short of the glory of God. If I want to know what God really intended when he created man, I must look at Jesus Christ and there I see God's ultimate intention for man. I see how God wanted me to live in fellowship with him. I see how God wanted me to live motivated completely by love, giving and going the extra mile because of love. We with open face beholding the glory of the Lord are being changed into that image from glory to glory. God is working in my life today changing me into his image. Now he's got a long way to go. I would not try to pretend that God has completed his work in me. Like the one fellow said, I ain't what I'm going to be, but thank God I ain't what I was. I've come a long way as God is working in me to conform me into the image of his son, Jesus Christ. There's a long way to go but we're on the road and that's what counts. 
Changes are taking place in my life week by week, month by month. As the Spirit of God works in me, those changes. The word change here is metamorphosis. It is the same word used when Jesus, it said, was transfigured before his disciples. It is the same word that Paul uses when he tells us in Romans to present our bodies as a living sacrifice unto God, holy and acceptable, and be not conformed to the world, but be ye transformed. Same Greek word, metamorphos. It is a transformation that is taking place through the work of God within my heart as I am changing form and being made into a new form even after the image of God being restored. And finally, Paul tells us the dynamics by which all of this is possible even by the Spirit of the Lord. Jesus said you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and ye shall be witnesses unto me. I can't do it myself. That was where Buddha and Confucianism failed. Because it pointed the ideal but gave no capacity for the fulfillment of the ideal, thus only left man in frustration. Jesus points the ideal. He said, this is the way, walk in it. But he then says, but you cannot, and therefore I will come, and by my Spirit I will indwell you, and I will begin to live my life through you. And by my dwelling in you, I will give to you the dynamic and the power to do what you could not do yourself. And so through that power of the Holy Spirit dwelling in me, He is the one who strengthens me and helps me to be what I could not be, to do what I could not do, as He works in me to bring me back into the image of God. And one day, God's work is going to be completed and I'm going to stand before him in his kingdom restored into his image. Complete, full, unbroken fellowship, one with the Father in spirit throughout all eternity. Beloved, now are we the sons of God. It doesn't yet appear what we're going to be, but we know that when he appears, we're going to be like him, restored to his image. We will be like him, for we will see him as he is. In the meantime, I keep my eyes on Jesus. And as I keep my eyes on Jesus, he works in me to restore me to the image. Now, a mistake that people often make, and be careful that you don't make it, they start getting their eyes on some man. They begin to try to parrot some man, to be like some man. We all have those whom we admire. That we seek to emulate. It is interesting to me, though, that when we seek to emulate someone we admire, we usually emulate some peculiar idiosyncrasy. I had a professor in college that I admired so greatly. And he was he had a, a, a sharp mind and a, and a good sense of humor. And he had a way of making some kind of a little noise in his throat after he had told a joke. 
and everybody was laughing. He had a way of making this peculiar little noise in his throat. And so I found myself after telling a joke, and I don't know how I even made the noise, but that little noise was coming out, you know. Stupid. Picked up this crazy little idiosyncrasy. Perhaps some of you have read of Smith Wigglesworth. He was a man of faith, and he was from England, but ministered here in the United States for a period of time. And, and uh, a lot of young ministers really uh, were attracted by this man's tremendous faith in God. He, he wrote some books on the subject of faith. Smith Wigglesworth had a uh, sort of a handlebar mustache. And while he was talking, he had a peculiar little idiosyncrasy of, of twisting the mustache. After he left the United States, you could go all over the country seeing ministers talking, <laughs> twisting an imaginary mustache. They didn't have a mustache, but they were still working on it, you know as you pick up some peculiar idiosyncrasy of the person that you admire. Like to be like someone else. My little granddaughter listening to the Praise For album, of course she thinks Grandpa's the greatest thing that ever happened in the world. That everything should be just like Grandpa. Everybody should be just like Grandpa. That he is the greatest servant that God ever had. I mean, she's really an admirer of Grandpa. And listening to the Praise 4 album when they're singing, uh, she sings along with it, you know, uh, draw me nearer, Holy Spirit, fill me up with your power. Give me boldness to spread your good news. But instead of boldness, she says, give me baldness to spread your good news. <laughs> Wants to be like Grandpa. But don't look to man. Don't get your eyes upon man. But keep your eyes on Jesus. We with open face beholding the glory of the Lord. Get your eyes on Jesus. Keep your eyes on Jesus. And as you keep your eyes on him, then he'll be bringing to pass those changes that are necessary in your life. For we all with unfailed face beholding the glory of the Lord are changed into the image from glory to glory even by the power of His Spirit working in us. Yes, restored to the image of God. That is the ultimate intention of God for each of your lives. And if you'll just keep your eyes on Jesus, it shall become a reality. Shall we pray? Father, thank you for the truth of your word that strikes our hearts this morning. Help us, Lord, to now be doers of the word and not hearers only. May we get our eyes upon Jesus and never take them off. Of him. Help us not to be distracted, Lord, by man, by material things, and lose sight of him. Lord, may we gaze steadfastly into his face that we might be changed into that image. In Jesus' name, amen. Man created in the image of God was given the power of choice, and each of you exercise your choices. And you can choose to be restored into the image of God, or you can choose to just continue your own self-directed path. But a wise man always looks down the path to where it leads. And if you're wise, before you make your choice,
you look down the path to see what is the end result. And those who choose to get their eyes on Jesus and follow him, the end result is restored into the image of God dwelling with him in his eternal kingdom of love and joy and peace. Can be yours if you choose. I would encourage you, if that is your choice, and you desire just to make it firm, that you go back to the prayer room this morning and there just ask God to take over your life and begin his work in you as you get your eyes upon Jesus Christ. God be with you and bless and keep you in his love. And may you walk in the light as he is in the light, experiencing that fellowship with God and that work of his spirit this week as he continues his work in conforming you into his own image. God bless you abundantly in Jesus' name.